as you know, it's the intention of the Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture Series to honor the idea of a free market economy as was reflected in the, the work of that distinguished Austrian school economist. Normally, the people who appear in such a series are distinguished uh, academics, defenders of the free market in that area. Earlier this week, as you know, we had a Nobel laureate here on campus in economics, Friedrich von Hayek. Tonight's situation is a special case. We have with us a man of affairs, a man who has had the personal experience of exploring the whole question of economics and our social structure and our institutional ideas and where we indeed should go from here. He's had the responsibility of, of making some hard decisions in that area. So he brings a special kind of expert knowledge to us. I scarcely need to introduce our speaker this evening, so let me take the advantage of a captive audience to tell you a story which I trust will be apropos. I know a lady who twice in her life has lost her country. She lost it the first time as a very young woman when in Tsarist Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution occurred and she barely escaped with her life. She came to Cuba, started again from scratch, once again built up a very successful competence, was doing very well, and this time as an elderly woman, again, she lost her country at the time Castro took over. Now, losing one's country once would be enough for most of us, I suppose. Losing one's country twice would be enough for the toughest person in the house, but not for this very indomitable lady. She came to the United States, where she started again from scratch, and again built up a very successful competence. And now as a very elderly person, I've heard her tell this story on more than one occasion, and invariably, someone in the audience, when she is finished, will say, you poor unlucky woman, how you have suffered, what an ordeal you have been through. And her answer is always the same. I, unlucky, Ah, no. I am one of the luckiest women who ever lived. Twice I have lost my country. Twice I have had a country to which I can go. When you Americans lose your country, where will you go? I've heard her ask the question more than once. I've never heard a convincing answer. If you look around the rest of the world, you'll see that in terms of what we hope for for our children, in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of the dignity of individual personality, that this is a world that doesn't value such things very highly just now. If it can't be done here in this country, it won't be done. And in fact, more and more Americans today have come to realize that. And as that realization has grown, we've done what all people should do in that case. We've looked around for a leader, someone in whom we could repose the kind of confidence necessary to lead us back to taking over our country once again. And, of course, we found that man. And for millions of Americans, that one man demonstrated both in elective office what he could do, and more important, he demonstrated in principle and integrity and in courage what real leadership can mean. He epitomizes for us exactly the effort to take this country back, to give our children the chance for the kind of prosperity and the kind of dignity that used to be associated with being typically American. Those values and those institutions are very much worthy of defense, and we have with us their outstanding defender. The battle isn't over yet, but he remains our leader as we get on with the task of taking our country back. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Governor Ronald Reagan. No, oh, thank you. You've done that well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, President Roach, and I hope if the people of Michigan are as intelligent as I believe they are, one day Senator Roach. I told some of the press this afternoon I was torn with mixed emotions on that. I know what he means. 
in the battle, the very important battle of preserving independent education in the United States. But I think perhaps he could continue doing that on a wider stage and fight for some other causes as well. You, ladies and gentlemen, students of Hillsdale, the friends of the, of the college, I'm delighted to be here first time, although I've been well acquainted for a long time with what Hillsdale means. And John, you've, you, you paved the way a little bit here with your most gracious remarks. I didn't deserve all of them, but uh, they eased my feeling about being here, speaking in these exact circumstances. You know, every speaker hopes that his remarks will be well chosen, well suited to the occasion, and every speaker has had the experience of not having that true. We had a fellow in Hollywood once for many years as an actor. He was working because his first love really was opera. And when he had saved enough money to study opera, he journeyed to Milan, Italy, studied opera, and after a period there was invited to sing at La Scala, the very spiritual fountainhead of opera. And they were doing Pagliacci. He sang the beautiful aria of Esti La Giuba, and when he'd finished, the applause from the balconies, the orchestra seats, the galleries were so sustained, so thunderous that the opera couldn't continue until he stepped back and repeated the aria as an encore. And again, the same sustained thunderous applause. And again, he sang Vesti La Juba. And this went on till finally he motioned for quiet and he tried to tell them on this, his first appearance, what a dream come true this was, to be greeted in this warm way. But he said, I have sung Vesti La Juba now nine times. My voice is gone. I cannot do it again. And a voice from the balcony said, you do it till you get it right. <laughs> you know, I say I'm delighted to be here, and yet I have an uncomfortable feeling that I'm saving souls in heaven. <laughs> you don't need the convincing that I usually try to do when, I, when I'm speaking on this subject. But maybe I can talk to you about the need for communication. One of the most recent things that I heard, of course, was that now, like so many other schools, you have a Young American for Freedom chapter on the campus, and I'm delighted to hear that because I've been a beneficiary of their support and help on a number of occasions. And I wish your new chapter well. But this thing of communication is more important than a willing speaker and a willing listener. It requires imparting some information, but also it's based on the manner in which it's done. And I had the real meaning of communication explained to me once by a fellow named Danny Villanueva, who used to place kick for the Los Angeles Rams and later the Dallas Cowboys, and then he became a sports announcer in Los Angeles. And he told me that he was having dinner one night over at the home of a young ball player with the Dodgers. You remember the Dodgers. And they were talking sports. The young wife was bustling about getting the dinner ready. And the baby started to cry. And over her shoulder, she said to her husband, James, the baby. And he was a young fellow. He was embarrassed. He looked at Danny and back at her. And he said, what do you mean, change the baby? I'm a ball player. That's not my line of work. And she turned around, put her hands on her hips, and she communicated. <laughs> she said, look, Buster, you lay the diaper out like a diamond. You put second base on home plate, put the baby's, put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound, hook up first and third, slide home underneath, and if it starts the rain, the game ain't called, you start all over <laughs> But if I can't save your souls, at least perhaps I might impart some information here that'll be helpful to you in the communication that has to take place. In the campaign last year, there was a great deal of talk about the seeming inability of an economic system that has provided more for more people than anything we've ever known to solve the problems of unemployment and inflation. Issues such as taxes and government power and costs were discussed but always these things were discussed in the context of what did government intend to do about them. Well, may I suggest for your consideration that government has already done too much about them. 
that indeed government by going outside its proper province has caused many if not most of the problems that vex us. There are a few of us old enough to remember when the only experience you ever had with the federal government was to go downtown to the post office and buy a stamp. They were two cents each for twice a day delivery. Now they're 13 cents for once a day delivery to the wrong address. <laughs> My friend Dewey Bartlett the senator from Oklahoma says that last three cents on the price is for storage. <laughs> and he's, he is, he suggested that we could improve the service if we started paying the postal employees by mail. <laughs> but how much are we to blame for what has happened? Beginning with the traumatic experience of the Great Depression, we, the people, have turned more and more to government for answers that government has neither the right nor the capacity to provide. But government as an institution always tends to increase in size and power. Not just this government, any government. It's built in. And so government attempted to provide the answers. The result is a fourth branch added to the traditional three of executive, legislative, and judicial. A vast federal bureaucracy that's now being imitated in too many states and too many cities. A bureaucracy of enormous power which determines policy to a greater extent than any of us realize. Very possibly to a greater extent than our own elected representatives. And it can't be removed from office by our votes. To give you an illustration, using another country, England, in 1803 created a new civil service position. It called for a man to stand on the cliffs of Dover with a spyglass and ring a bell if he saw Napoleon coming. They didn't eliminate that job until 1945. <laughs> In our own country, there are only two government programs that we have totally wiped out and abolished. The government stopped making rum in the Virgin Islands and we've stopped breeding horses for the cavalry. We bear a greater tax burden than to support that permanent structure than any of us would have believed possible just a few decades ago. When I was where you are in college, governments, federal, state, and local, were taking a dime out of every dollar earned. And less than a third of that paid for the federal establishment. Today, governments, federal, state, and local are taking 44 cents out of every dollar earned, and two-thirds of that supports Washington. It is the fastest growing item in the average family budget, and yet it is not one of the factors used in computing the cost of living index. It is the biggest single cost item in the family budget. It is bigger than food, shelter, and clothing all put together. When government tells us, as it did a few weeks ago, that in the last year the people of America have increased their earnings 9%, and since the inflation was 6%, well, we were still three percentage points better off richer than we were the year before. Government is being deceitful. That was before taxes. After taxes, the people of America are three percentage points worse off, poorer, than they were before they got the 9% raise. Government profits by inflation. The economic conference in London several months ago, one of our American representatives there was talking to the press. And he said, you have to recognize that inflation doesn't have any single cause. It's caused by a number of things, and therefore there is no single answer. Well, if he believed that, he had no business being at an economic conference. Inflation is caused by one thing, and it has one answer. It's caused by government spending more than government takes in, and it will go away when government stops doing that, and not before. I could give you a figure that I think would explain it because government has been trying to make all of us believe that somehow inflation is like a plague or the drought or the locust coming, that no one has any control over it and we just have to bear it when it comes along and hope it'll go away. No, it's simpler than that. From 1933 until now, our country has doubled the amount of goods and purchases that are available for purchase the goods and services. In that same period, we have multiplied the money supply by 23 times. 
So eleven and a half dollars are now chasing what one dollar used to chase. And that's all that inflation is, a depreciation of the value of money. I know that this is called the Ludwig von Mises series, but do you know that before I knew that, I had a line I intended to give you. It's a quote of him, if you haven't heard it. Ludwig von Mises said that government is the only agency that can take a perfectly useful commodity like paper, smear it with some ink, and render it absolutely useless. <laughs> Sometimes I think that government fits that old-fashioned definition of a baby, an alimentary canal with an appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. <laughs> There are 73 million of us working and earning in the private sector. We support ourselves and our dependents. There, we support, in addition, 81 million other Americans totally dependent on tax dollars for their year-round living. Now, it's true that 15 million of those are public employees, and they also pay taxes. But their taxes are simply a return to government of dollars that first had to be taken from the 73 million. I say this to emphasize that the people working and earning in the private sector are the only resource that government has. Political demagogues aided by spokesmen for a variety of causes, some worthy in themselves but questionable as to whether they're a proper concern of government, have created a political and economic mythology widely believed by too many people. This is why we need the communications. This, more than anything else, has increased government's ability to interfere as it does in the marketplace. Profit is a dirty word blamed for most of our social ills. In the interest of something called consumerism, free enterprise is becoming far less free. Property rights are being reduced and even eliminated in the name of environmental protection. It is time that a voice be raised in behalf of the 73 million pointing out that profit, property rights, and freedom are inseparable, and you cannot have the third unless you continue to be entitled to have the first two. And yet, and yet, even among us who perhaps believe that way, we have fallen into the habit of when something goes wrong of saying there ought to be a law. Sometimes I think there ought to be a law against saying there ought to be a law. A German statesman, Bismarck, said, if you like sausages and laws, you should never watch either one of them being made. <laughs> it's difficult to understand the ever-increasing number of intellectuals in the groves of academia, present company accepted, who contend that our system could be improved by the adoption of some of the, of the features of socialism. It isn't that these eminent scholars are ignorant, it's just that they know a number of things that aren't true. <laughs> In any comparison between the free market system and socialism, nowhere is the miracle of capitalism more evident than in the production and distribution of food. We eat better for a lower percentage of earnings than any other people on earth. It averages about 17% of the average family income after taxes. The American farmer is producing two and a half times as much as he did 60 years ago with one-third the man-hours on one-half the land. And if his counterparts worldwide could reach his level of skill, we could feed the entire world population on one-tenth of the land that is now being farmed worldwide. The biggest example, I think, of course, comes when you compare the two superpowers. I'm sure that most of you are aware that some years ago the Soviet Union had such a morale problem with the workers on their collective farms that they finally gave each one of those workers a little plot of ground and told him he could farm it for himself. And if he wanted to, he could sell in the open market what he raised. Today, less than 4% of Russia's agricultural land is privately farmed in that way. And on that 4% is raised 40% of all of Russia's vegetables and 60% of all the meat. Some of our scholars did some research on comparative food prices. They had to take the prices in the Russian stores and our own stores and translate them into minutes and hours of labor at the average income of each country. And with one exception, they found that 
Russians have to work two to ten times as long to buy the various food items than do their counterparts here in America. The one exception was potatoes. There, the price on their potato bins uh, worked out to less work time for them than it did for us. There was one hitch. They didn't have any potatoes. <laughs> and yet, in spite of all the evidence that points to the free market as the most efficient system, we continue down a road that is bearing out the prophecy of that Frenchman who came here 130 years ago, de Tocqueville. He was attracted by the miracle that was America. Think of it. Our country was only 70 years old, and already we had achieved such a miracle of standard of living and of productivity and prosperity that the rest of the world was amazed. So he came here and he looked at everything he could see in our country, trying to find the secret of our success, and then went back and wrote a book about it. But even then, 130 years ago, he saw signs that prompted him to warn us that if we weren't constantly on guard, we would find ourselves covered by a network of regulations controlling every activity. And he said if that came to pass, we would one day find ourselves a nation of timid animals with government the shepherd. Well, we are covered by tens and tens of thousands of regulations to which we add about 25,000 new ones each year. One of the newer agencies, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has touched virtually everyone's life, OSHA. There's a fellow in Indiana with a shop. He's got seven employees. At the front and back of his tiny shop, there is a 12-foot door each end. OSHA has just told him he has to install exit signs in the event that a new employee might become confused in case of fire and not be able to find his way out. He asked a pretty logical question. He said, if he can't see a 12-foot door, how is he going to see that exit sign? <laughs> uh, anyway. uh, I'm sure that everyone in this room at some time or other has had an occasion to climb a ladder. Simple wooden ladder. You put it up and climb it. How in the world did we ever accomplish that without OSHA's 144 rules and regulations with regard to climbing a ladder? They've now written the first of which is that to climb a ladder, you begin by facing it. <laughs> and then, of course, I don't know whether you know about their discovery of the hazards of farm life. They wrote quite a manual on that to save the farmer from accident. One of them said that in walking about the farm, one should keep his eyes on the ground because here and there, there might be a slippery substance which, if you step in it, could cause a nasty fall. <laughs> You know no farmer would have thought of that by himself. <laughs> well, now they've discovered deep-sea divers. There's 600 of them in the whole United States. It's a hazardous profession, and their pay reflects it. They get from fifty dollars to $100,000 a year. But it isn't going to be as dangerous if OSHA has its way. They've got a whole manual now, rules, regulations, and required equipment. They haven't implemented that program as yet because the United States Navy also has di divers. And it has informed OSHA that if they implement their program, henceforth each diver will go beneath the waves weighing 1,000 pounds. <laughs> the General Accounting Office, which is responsible for public employees' safety, has just recently inspected the building in Washington where OSHA is headquartered. They have found it in violation of 300 of OSHA's safety rules. <laughs> But all of this becomes deadly serious when you think about the expense. A study of 700 of the largest corporations has found that if we could eliminate unnecessary regulation of business and industry, we would instantly reduce the inflation rate by half. Other economists have found that overregulation of business and industry is, amounts to a hidden five cent sales tax for every consumer. The misdirection of capital investment costs us a quarter of a million jobs. That's half as many as the president wants to create by spending $32 billion over the next two years. And with all of this comes a burden of government-required paperwork. It affects education. All of you here are aware of the problems of finance and education, particularly at the, at the private educational institutions. I had the president of a university tell me the other day that government-required paperwork on his campus alone 
has raised the administrative cost from $65,000 to $600,000. That would underwrite a pretty good chair. Now, the president of the Eli Liddy Drug Company says their drug company spends more on time, man hours, on government-required paperwork than they do today on heart and cancer research combined. He told of submitting one ton of paper, 120,000 pages of scientific data, most of which he said were absolutely worthless for FDA's purposes, in triplicate, in order to get a license to market an arthritis medicine. So the United States is no longer first in the development of new health-giving drugs and medicines. We're producing 60% fewer than we were 15 years ago. As late as 1962, the average cost of developing and testing a new medicine was about $1 million, and it took about two to four years. Now it is $40 million and takes anywhere from seven and a half to 20 years. A change came with the adoption of some, red, some amendments to the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetic Act of 1962. We could do something about it. There's a young rancher who's now a congressman, Steve Sims. There in Washington, he has before Congress with 113 co-signers a bill to simply repeal those amendments and not replace them with anything. It wouldn't affect our safety one bit. All it takes to get them repealed is if enough people could be aware that that bill is there and write letters to their congressmen and their representatives and make them know that we want such a bill passed. Why not? It adds 50 cents to the cost of this paperwork that I'm talking about, adds 50 cents to the cost of every prescription written in the United States. Now, maybe some say, well, it's not our problem. Leave it to the drug industry. Well, then how about the in independent businessmen and women of this country who spend $50 billion a year sending 10 billion pieces of paper to Washington, where it costs $20 billion each year of tax money to shuffle and store that paper away. I have already mentioned the overhead for complying of colleges and universities. But we're so used to talking billions. Does anyone realize how much a single billion is? A billion minutes ago, Christ was walking on this earth. A billion hours ago, our ancestors lived in caves, and it's questionable as to whether they discovered the use of fire. A billion dollars ago was 19 hours in Washington, D.C., and it'll be another billion in the next 19 hours and every 19 hours until they adopt a new budget, at which time it'll be almost a billion and a half. But let me really paint the picture for you. If you gentlemen sent your wives out on a shopping spree and gave them each a billion dollars, I told them not to spend more than $1,000 a day. They won't be home for 3,000 years. <laughs> but you know, if you lose your economic freedom, you lose your political freedom, all freedom. Freedom is something that cannot be passed on in the bloodstream or genetically. And it's never more than one generation away from extinction. Every generation has to learn how to protect and defend it, or it's gone, and gone for a long, long time. Already, many of us, particularly those in business and industry, there are too many who have switched rather than fight. And it's time that particularly some of our corporations learn that when you get in bed with government, you're going to get more than a good night's sleep. We should take inventory and see how many things we can do ourselves that we've come to believe that only government can do. Let me take one that I'm sure everyone thinks is, is a government monopoly and properly so. But do you know that in Scottsdale, Arizona, there is no city fire department? But the per capita fire loss is one third of that of other cities of similar size and the per capita cost for fire protection, one third. And the insurance rates reflect this. Scottsdale contracts out with a private, profit-making firefighting company, which now has about a dozen clients out in the western states, cities doing the same thing. Denton, Arkansas had a hot lunch program, and they were having trouble with it in their school. The kids wouldn't eat there because the food, they said, was too poor in quality. The school board was losing about $1,000 a month. Finally, in disgust, they went out and talked to McDonald's. 
McDonald's came in and set up shop in the school cafeteria. McDonald's is making a profit. Ten times as many kids are eating there every noon, and the school board's saving the taxpayers a thousand dollars a month. Two thirds of the cities and towns in America contract out with private companies for garbage disposal. Those two thirds of the cities and towns in this country get their garbage picked up for 68 percent less than the cities and towns that have their own municipal departments. Have the great corporations, sometimes I worry, have they abdicated their responsibility to preserve the freedom of the marketplace out of a fear of retaliation or a reluctance to rock the boat? If they have, they're feeding the crocodile, hoping you'll eat them last. We can fight City Hall, and you don't have to be a giant to do it. In New Mexico, there's a little company, a husband and wife own it. She's the president. And they... They have five employees, and the other day, two OSHA inspectors arrived at the door, and they demanded to come in to go on a hunting expedition, see if there were any violation of their safety rules, and if there were, there were automatic fines. There is no appeal. And she said, where's your, law, your, your warrant? And they said, we don't need one. She said, you do to come in here and shut the door. Well, they went out and they got a warrant, and they came back, but this time she had her lawyer with her, and he looked at it. And he said it does not show probable cause. And a federal court upheld her right to do this. Up in Pocatello, Idaho, was a man, elderly man with grown sons. They owned a subcontracting plumbing and electrical firm, 35 employees. He had known that someday they would get to his door, and he'd wondered what he would do. And he knew about, he'd heard about the woman in New Mexico. Sure enough, they came to his door. And he said, not without a warrant. And they read in paragraph 8A of the OSHA Act. And he pointed to a framed copy of the Constitution on the wall of his office and said, I think there's a higher law. Well, they came back not with a warrant, but with a court order. He defied it. He was cited for contempt. He got a lawyer. Now his friends and even the lawyer tried to talk him out of it. They said, you can't fight the government. That's too big for you. And I just love what he said to his friends. He said, you know... We send our young fellows out to fight and die for freedom. Maybe it's time some of us old duffers did something for a change. Today, his case is before the United States Supreme Court because a federal court has ruled that OSHA is in violation of our constitutional protection against illegal search and seizure. But why don't more of us challenge what Cicero called the arrogance of officialdom? Why don't we set up communications between organizations, trade associations, to rally others to come to the aid of an individual like that, or to an industry or profession, when they're thre threatened by the barons of bureaucracy, who have forgotten that we are their employers? Government by the people works when the people work at it. We could begin by turning the spotlight of truth on the widespread political and economic mythology that I mentioned. A recent poll of college and university students, they must have skipped this campus, because in this poll they found that the students estimated that business profits in America averaged 45 percent. That's nine times the average of business profits in this country. But it was understandable that the kids made that mistake, because the professors in the same poll guessed that the profits were even higher. Then there's the fairy tale born of political demagoguery that the tax structure imposes unfairly on the low earner with loopholes designed for the more affluent. Well, again, the truth. At $23,000 of earnings, you become one of that exclusive band of 10% of the earners in America. And that 10% pays 50% of the income tax, but only takes 5% of all the deductions, the so-called loopholes that are allowed by law. The other 95% are taken by the 90% of earners below 23,000 who pay the other half of the tax. The most dangerous myth is the demagoguery that business can be made to pay a larger share, thus relieving the individual. Politicians preaching this are either deliberately dishonest or economically illiterate, and the other one should scare us. Business doesn't pay taxes, and who better than business to make this message known? Only people 
pay taxes. And people pay, as consumers, every tax that is assessed against a business. Begin with the food and fiber raised in the farm, to the ore drilled in a mine, to the oil and the gas from out of the ground, whatever it may be, through the processing, through the manufacturing, on out to the retailer's license. If the tax cannot be included in the price of the product, no one along that line can stay in business. And if you want to explain it simply, a loaf of bread. If the farmer can't get enough for his wheat to pay the tax on his farm, the real estate tax, he can't go on raising wheat. And so when you buy that loaf of bread tomorrow, just take a look. 151 taxes are in that loaf of bread amounting to more than half of the price of the bread. The federal government has used its taxing power to redistribute earnings, to achieve a variety of social reforms. Politicians love those indirect business taxes because it hides the cost of government. During the New Deal days, an undersecretary of the Treasury told the Congress, indeed wrote a book in which he said, the taxes can serve a higher purpose than just raising revenue. He said they could be an instrument of social and economic control to redistribute the wealth and income and to penalize particular industries and economic groups. We need to put an end to that. We need a simplification of the tax structure. We need an indexing of the surtax brackets, a halt to government's illicit profiting through inflation. It's as simple as this. Every time the cost of living index goes up 1%, government's revenue goes up 1.5%. And above all, we need an overall cut in the cost of government. Government spending isn't a stimulant to the economy, it's a drag on the economy. Only a decade ago, about 15% of corporate gross income was required to pay the interest on corporate debt. Now it's 40%. Individuals and families once spent about 8% of their disposable income on interest on consumer debt, the installment buying, mortgage, and so forth. Today it's almost one-fourth of their total earnings. State and local government in the last 15 years has gone from 70 to 220 billion. The total private and public debt is growing four times as fast as the output of goods and services. Again, there's something we can do. I don't know, has Jack been here yet in the series or is he coming? He's coming. He's coming. Well, you'll be treated to Jack Kemp. He used to quarterback for the Buffalo Bills and now he's a congressman from New York. He has a bill before the Congress. It is designed to increase productivity, to create jobs for people, and it's as simple as this. It calls for over a three-year period re reducing across the board the income tax cut for all of us by a full one-third. And also, it would reduce the corporate tax from 48 to 45 percent. The base income tax would no longer be 20, it would be 14 percent, and the ceiling would be 50 percent instead of 70, and it would double the exemption for smaller businesses before they get into the surtax bracket. It would do all the things that we need to provide investment capital and to increase productivity and create jobs. We can say this with assurance because it's been done twice before. In the 20s under Coolidge and again in the 60s under John F. Kennedy. In the 60s, the stimulus to the economy was so immediate that even government's revenues increased because of the broadening base of the economy. But the Congress the majority is concerned with further restrictions on our freedom, land planning that threatens the very concept of private ownership, the Humphrey Hawkins bill, which would regulate this economy to, in, to an extent that has never been practiced outside of socialist or totalitarian power. In my own state of California, the legislature is talking about using tax funds to establish a state-owned bank to compete with private banks. Well. Jack Kemp's bill has been voted down. He's brought it up five times, and the majority in Congress has voted it down. But every time, more come across the aisle and vote with him. The last time, he had 195 votes, and he's getting ready to put it up for the sixth time. Again, if the people will make their wants known to Congress, you'll get what you want. You see, it isn't necessary to make Congress see the light. Just make them feel the heat. <laughs> I've talked about the co communications we need. We can't let the doctor remain alone in his lonely fight against socialized medicine. 
Or the oil industry fight its own battle against divestiture or crippling controls, repressive taxes? Or the farmer, who hurts more than most because of government harassment and rule changing in the middle of the game? All of these issues concern each one of us, regardless of what our trade or our profession may be. Corporate America must begin to realize that it has allies in the independent businessmen and women, and the shopkeepers, the craftsmen, the farmers, and the professions. All these men and women are organized in a great variety of ways, but we talk within our own organizations about our own problems, the drug industry for itself. What we need is a liaison between these organizations to realize how much strength we as a people still have if we'll use that strength. I mentioned oil. Is there anyone that isn't concerned with the energy problem? Government caused that problem while we all stood by unaware that we were involved. Unnecessary regulations and prices imposed price limits back in the 50s are the direct cause of today's crisis. Our crisis isn't because of a shortage of fuel, it's a surplus of government. Now we have a new agency. We have a new agency of enormous power. 20,000 employees and a $10.5 billion budget. That's more than the gross earnings of the top seven oil companies in the United States, and that's just to start with. It is nothing more than a first step toward nationalization of the oil industry. And you know when they tell us about the conservation, of course we should save. No one should waste a natural resource. But they act as if we found all the oil and gas there is to be found in this continent, if not the world. Do you know that 57 years ago, our government told us we only had enough left for 15 years? And 19 years went by and they told us we only had enough left for 13 more years. And we've done a lot of driving since then and we'll do a lot more if government will do one simple thing. Get out of the way and let the incentives of the marketplace urge the industry out to find the sources of energy this country needs. It has been said that politics is the second oldest profession. <laughs> and I've come to realize and over the last few years it bears a great similarity to the first. <laughs> Why can't we look at other nations that have chosen this path of government intervention before us? Our British cousins. They're where we'll be in 15 years if we continue in the present course, if we have that much time. For 40 years, Sweden has been held up to us as an example that socialism really will work. There's an enlightened country, they say, and look how well they're doing. Well, it was just a little over a year ago that the Swedes went to the polls and voted against Karl Marx. I think maybe the straw that broke the camel's back was a change in the income tax laws. They changed the tax to read that at $33,000 of earnings, the tax rate was 102%. We've had enough of sideline kibitzers telling us the system which they themselves have thrown out of sync with their social tinkering can be improved or saved if we'll only have more of that tinkering or even government planning and management. They play fast and loose with a system that for 200 years made us the light of the world, the refuge for people from all over the world who just yearn to breathe free. You heard the moving story of the woman who came through two countries and finally to this country. It's time we recognize that the system, no matter what our problems are, has never failed us once. Every time we have failed the system, usually by lacking faith in it, usually by saying we have to change and do something else. If you want an example of the power of this system, the government told us a short time ago that the new poverty level in the United States was $5,500 of earnings. At $5,500 and down, you are living in poverty in America. $5,500 is eight times as high as the average standard of living for the rest of the world. A Supreme Court justice has said, the time has come, indeed is long overdue, for the wisdom, ingenuity, and resources of American business to be marshaled against those who would destroy it. What specifically should be done? The first essential for the businessman is to confront the problem as a primary responsibility of corporate management. It's been said that history is the patter of silken slippers descending the stairs. 
and the thunder of hobnailed boots coming up. Back through the years, we have seen people fleeing the thunder of those boots to seek refuge in this land. And now too many of them, like the lady from Cuba, have seen signs, the signs that were ignored in their homeland before the end came, signs appearing here. They wonder if they'll have to flee again, but they know there is no place to run to. Will we, before it is too late, use the vitality and the magic of the marketplace to save this way of life? Or will we one day face our children and our children's children when they ask us where we were and what we were doing on the day that freedom was lost? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Reagan. The governor has agreed to answer questions for a few minutes. You'll notice that there are two microphones downstairs and another above. And the idea of that is not only so that the governor can hear the question, but also the audience. So he would entertain some questions for a few minutes. Governor, if you just feel them yourself. Maybe I should quit while the head, yes. Okay, Governor Reagan, uh, how do you feel about the Carter Bay instant uh, voter plan, and what effects do you feel will have on the American Democratic process? Uh, the, the Carter, which plan? The instant voter registration. Oh, the instant voter registration right. plan. Well, I'm again it. <laughs> uh, this idea that was proposed that the showing of a social security card at the polls on election day would be enough identification to prevent fraud. He must not have noticed that woman in Chicago recently who was indicted for fraud, convicted of fraud. She had 50 social security cards and was collecting welfare under 127 different names. Um, social security itself has admitted that they have no way of telling how many people in the country have more than one social security card, but they estimate that it is in the millions. And this, I just say, is an indication of how difficult it is. We. We have, we have difficulty now with the present system against voter fraud. But to suggest that registration, the difficulty of registration, is what's keeping people from participating in the democratic process, I think ignores reality. The truth of the matter is, how do they explain then the people who are already registered who don't go to the polls? I just came from Denver. Last night's paper in Denver had the results of their elections all over the state, local elections and so forth. And I saw city after city electing mayors and city councilmen and as low as 9% of the registered voters going to the polls. I don't, think there's, I don't think we should ever take a chance with that. Maybe if we made it a little more difficult, people would think there was something worthwhile in it and go vote. <laughs> I understand, and settled against it. They voted against it. Yeah. All right. It shows the people are smarter than, <laughs> than politicians. Uh, Governor Reagan, I uh, agree completely with your analysis of the loss of freedom that has occurred in the United States, having been born in England and presently living in Canada, which is uh, going the same route that England has gone now. Um, recently, when Rhodes Boyce, a member of Parliament from England, was here, he stated that um, after a certain point, the lost freedom, uh, of lost freedom in a country, there becomes a point um, when the fight for it becomes, you might say, like a, uh, as he put it, a, a bloody civil war where we've lost so much that to return is, is almost, as he put it, to be a civil war. Have we reached that point? No, I, I, I missed some of the first part there. You gotta get right into that, that microphone here. You were t talking about rioting, and have we reached the point of... Well, have, have we reached the point where we've lost so much freedom that you might say the journey back to where this country started from is now um, not quite impossible, but at a point where it's going to be a vicious, uh, almost civil war, as Rhodes Boyson put it in his analysis. No, have we reached the point where it would take almost civil war violence uh, to, to regain the freedoms that we've lost? 
in this country. Um, no, I don't believe it at all, and I can give a couple of indications. A couple of years ago, some of you maybe bought a new car, and it had, under the law passed by Congress, the interbelt seat lock device. And you went through the irritation of finding you couldn't back the car out of the garage and unless you strapped yourself in. You couldn't put the groceries on the front seat or the car wouldn't start. It only took Congress about two weekends home to find out how... <laughs> and remember, these were just the people that had bought new cars to find out how mad they were and Congress voted it out. And there's been a more recent one. There wasn't a person in this world would have bet that the House of Representatives would have voted against the common situs picketing bill. As a matter of fact, I can tell you because I was helping a little bit in the strategy for the Senate. The Senate had felt it was such a lost cause that their only hope to defeat it was through a filibuster, and they were trying to line up 40 Senate votes who would preserve clo uh, not, uh, not allow cloture to, to end the filibuster. And suddenly the House of Representatives voted against common situs. Well, a week later, I was in Washington, and I said, what happened? And the answer was very simple. They said, we heard from the folks back home. No, it, believe me, it is, we have the power, but it's as simple as this. A poll revealed recently that only 46% of the people in this country can name their United States congressman. And of the 46% who can name him, 85% can't tell you a single thing about him other than his name. They don't know how he votes or what he represents or what his philosophy is. Again, it's we who have failed the system provided for us of running government. The result is politicians run us. And it can all be changed if we will begin using the power we have as voters. And I, and I think that the pendulum is swinging. I know that... Uh, corporate America, which I mentioned critically in my remarks. One corporation has funded a school at the University of Southern California and the business college there. Uh, they're holding seminars throughout the country on a program of communication for corporations, for example, employers to communicate with their employees, with their stockholders, even in their advertising, that it's now part of their battle, all in the defense of free enterprise. So, no, I'm not discouraged. But we just got to move fast, and again, as I say, we got to start talking to each other. Mm. Reagan, uh, I'm from Adrian College. That's a sister institution of higher learning. In Could Asia. you get right into the mic there? Or I... Governor Reagan, I'm from Adrian College, and that's a sister institution of higher learning in Adrian, Michigan. And I'm going to put you in a hypothetical situation, whereas I'm making you an honorary professor. And in your class, you have a slow learner named Jimmy Carter. And I'd like to know what his midterm grade is so far. <laughs> Long on style and short on substance. <laughs> Governor, this is a, a nonpartisan meeting, I know, so I won't tell you that I'm the chairman of one of the two major parties in the neighboring county. I think Senator Roche sounds fine, but President Reagan sounds even better. <laughs> I you wouldn't from... send a president up there alone without a lot of fellows <laughs> like this to help him, would you? <laughs> Heavens no. I come from an area that there are a lot of farmers, and I would, uh, for their benefit, like to know what your view is of the proposed agricultural strike in December. Well, I can understand the impatience and the anger that has led to that, the idea of a strike. I've, uh, we think of it sometimes in taxpayer strikes, uh, in others at the time when they seem to be ignored. I think the farmer today's problem is that he has been caught more than anyone in the cost-price squeeze. Uh, because the cost of operation has gone up out of everything he buys and everything he has to pay for, from seed to fertilizer to machinery and so forth, and to labor. And yet, uh, with a great wave at the political level uh, to favor the consumer, uh, he stands caught in the middle. And there is no question that today, as you must be well aware, 
Uh, farmers, for example, are selling corn in the Corn Belt uh, for a little more than half of what it actually costs to raise. Much the same situation prevails in the, in the wheat market. I would hope that we, we could find a solution, and while I'm, I'm sure that under the circumstances today the only, the only recourse has to be at least temporarily government for this, I would hope it would not be, as the Carter administration has suggested, a return to the farm program of some time ago of subsidy and regulation, crop limitation and so forth. I would hope it would be a market solution, but first to get over the crisis before we find great tragedy uh, to, a, to a great many individuals in that industry, and then uh, a free and open worldwide market. It's just impossible to recognize how we can have, in a hungry world, the most productive, the only country of almost in the world that can do more than feed itself, but has so much to export, that, uh, uh, that we can have the problems we're having. I, th I thought uh, a year or two ago in the famous wheat thing, where the government, after urging them to plant all the wheat and then change the rules, uh, was totally against any fairness, and I, I just, I believe there's a solution. I worry that it's going to, to go the other way, uh, try a backward step toward what we got rid of. I don't know whether you know this, but down in Iowa, there are bumper stickers appearing that say, we want our butts back. That's B-U-T-Z. <laughs> Someone else for the... Governor, yeah. I believe there's time for one more question. Oh, dear. All right. <laughs> I have a couple of things. One of them is that we're, we're uh, nationally driving 55 miles an hour in the U.S. Britain is 70. In Germany, I get passed by people going 125 miles an hour, and they don't even produce any oil or gas. Well, that's something for us just to think about. My question really is this. We know what our terrible balance of payments is. Ours is a small company. We export a lot of things. Right now, if you know what 921P is, do you know that regulation, that form? It has to do with the boycott. The Israeli and the Arab boycott, or any boycott. Yeah. We really don't know what to do. We sell both to the Arabs and the Israelis, okay? Yeah. We got a letter of credit. The letter of credit says it must be shipped, must not be shipped in Israeli bottom if it's going to Egypt. I don't find any fault with that. But the government apparently does. We don't know what to do about it. But I turn right around, I've got the same situation in both countries. Well, I have to say again here, I think that we were on our way to having an influence in the Middle East in which the United States had displaced the Soviet Union influence in the Arab countries. Uh, that was under a previous administration, whatever anyone may want to think about it. And both sides were ready to recognize the United States as able to sit at a table with them and help them solve the very complex problems. I think we've gone a ways backward from that. We've brought Russia back into the Middle East problem after taking three years to get them out. And I, I happen to believe that there's enough right on both sides that our government here in the international field should be in a position to help, and I don't agree uh, with the boycott and the, free, and the free market that is going on. And I believe that the United States government could be more help than it has been in working out this particular problem. Thank you. There was a, if I could, because it's been all male so far, there was a young lady, and I, I just, I'll take one extra here. I don't um. want to keep you beyond it. Governor Reagan, the Democratic Party has made it a point to appeal to the common man. And while many of their policies do not, in fact, benefit him, nonetheless, it seems to be a successful political ploy. Now, my question is, what strategy do you see for the Republican Party as being most effective in winning the traditionally Democratic vote? Mm. Uh, I'd like to answer that. I know this is a nonpartisan gathering. But... Let me explain something. I was a Democrat most of my life. Uh, I only fairly recently became a Republican as I found the party going down a path that I didn't think I could follow any longer. I believe the Republican Party 
has labored under an image that doesn't fit if it ever did, that has been handed to it that even a lot of Republicans tend to believe it, that we're the party of the fat cats. I've never been able to understand why a rich Republican is a fat cat and a rich Democrat is a public-spirited philanthropist. But, uh, <laughs> But part of the blame has come from the Republican Party itself. As we would see Democratic victories, and particularly in the New Deal years going on, the Republican Party sort of went over into a position of not representing anything but saying, well, uh, you know, um, we'll do the same things the Democrats are doing even though we don't believe in it in order to get your votes. And finally, we have the biggest bunch of voters in America are not registered in either party, Now, they decline to state because they say there isn't a nickel's difference between the parties. Well, there is. I think that last year, a revolution took place in Kansas City, last August, or a year ago last August. The the convention was handed as usual. Party platforms for a half a century have been bland generalities so designed as to be quickly forgotten and not to embarrass any candidate. And last year, the typical platform was handed down from the hierarchy to the platform committee in Kansas City. And then the rank-and-file delegates who sat on that committee threw it away, and they wrote a platform, which I recommend to anyone's reading. They wrote a platform that spelled out exactly what this party represents, what it will stand for, that it will not compromise, and makes it perfectly clear. It just hasn't been done before. And my appeal to Republicans is to raise that platform as a statement of principles of our party and say to the disenchanted Democrats and say to the independents, here, this this is what we stand for. And I say that because my belief is that a political party is not a club or a society of which you have loyalty to it for the old school tie. A political party is nothing but a practical, mechanical structure created to further a cause. And it is the cause that brings people together and holds them together. And they need the structure to advance their cause. And what we need to do is give the people of this country something I think they're crying for. I think there is a great new majority of Democrats, Independents, and Republicans who are waiting and praying that someone will erect a banner of bold colors that they say, that's for me. Let me rally around that flag. And if the Republicans can do this, no more uh, giving each other political saliva tests to determine the degree of our Republican purity. Uh, (laughs) let Let us weigh our Republicanism on our support of that platform. Morality and international dealings. Yes, better relations with the mainland of China, but not by throwing away the Republic of China on Taiwan as a friend and ally. That's in that part. We've even got in a platform that we shouldn't give the canal away. <laughs> I believe that, that this we can do, and I think that there is there's that kind of a, a sentiment and a movement on foot. There have been four special elections for Congress since the last general election. And in three of the four, in blue-collar Democratic districts, Republicans have won three of the four races. In each case, bright young men who really were not career politicians, young men who had a cause they believed in, like a certain potential senator I know, and who's willing to give up his private life in order to work for that, that cause. And uh, the president uh, went down and tried to help their opponents in, in their districts. And one of those, the last one of the three that won, is the first Republican congressman in his district in Louisiana in 103 years. So. Uh, I think that what we need is to quit talking in abstract, to talk to the men and women of this country in terms they understand. Free enterprise is a wonderful expression, but it can be a kind of a a theory up there of economics. All right, let's get it down to what it really means. 
It means you young people having the right to decide what you'll study, what you'll plan to be with your lives, what occupation you'll fill. I've spoken to a graduating class, and I had the pleasure of telling them what a contrast it was on the other side of the world, in the Soviet Union, when they graduate. When they graduate, in walk some representatives of the government and read off a list of names telling them which factories and plants and jobs they will report to the next day. And that's it for them. And the only thing, I've got to leave, I've got to close, but to all you young people here, measure everything that's proposed by government in what is the price you pay in individual freedom and demand the right to fly as high and as far as your own strength and ability will take you without being penalized for your initiative or your effort. There is nothing wrong with success. This country's great goal and great dream is the equal right of everybody to become as unequal as their own ability will make them. Thank you very much.